Hi, Tom. Hey, um, am, am I live? If, if you guys could just say something in the chat, it'd really help me out. This is my first solo real guitar live. Um, I'm a little nervous, quite honestly, but I'm sure we're going to nail this together. Help me out. Let me know it's working. Um, I hope everybody on this is well and safe. And I know these are difficult times for a lot of people. Um, I figure the best thing I could do is to, uh, along with take care of my family and my uh, team, is to keep the lessons going. And I know for a lot of people, uh, music is one of the things they can do in their home that um, keeps things happening, make them feel good, keeps feeling like you're moving forward, practicing. At least that's how I tend to work. So I, I have been making some new songs. I'll be happy to share some of those on uh, YouTube a little bit later. Anyway, um, I'm going to answer questions today. I don't have anything to present. I have quite a few questions that were uh, presented ahead of time. And I would love to have you put questions in the chat. Um, I'll be looking over at the chat and <laughs> doing anything I need to with my guitar here. Uh, afterwards, when it looks like the questions have all died down, and I'll stay as long as I need to to answer your questions, I'll go ahead and uh, give away a, a gift certificate from Amazon to the people on my Real Guitar Success uh, membership who have completed the monthly practice session, which is what we normally do in these Real Guitar Lives. So with that said, let me get started with the first questions. Hi, hi, bud, and uh, Mr. Pesky. Richard, good to have you here. Uh, this is interesting. I, um, okay, I've, I've never actually looked at the chat. It's always Ami who, who does this, but uh, it's kind of neat. Anyway, um, let me start with the first questions. Um, oh, probably I should have brought them up ahead of time. But I can do them right here on my computer. Ooh, and they're big. <laughs> good, good for me. <laughs> Can't see that good anymore. Uh, the first question is by Hame. And he's asking a question about, is it normal to have pain in the fingertips when you're first learning guitar? And am I doing something wrong? And uh, it's, is there something I can do to relieve the pain? This is a, a very common question. And in fact, um, I think most beginners have this problem. Um, I know I did when I first started playing guitar and everybody I knew at the time had the same issue. The thing is, um, it is normal, and in the course of things, your fingers get tougher, not just calluses, though that's what most people will say, hey, I get calluses and now it doesn't hurt. But really, over time, what happens is the nerves tend to recede a little bit. They kind of get used to it and they say, hey, we're going to be doing this. We might as well start stop uh, screaming about it. <laughs> it's the same kind of thing when you go walking barefoot in the summers. When I was a kid, we used to do a lot of walking around in the summertime. At first, my feet were really sensitive and every little grain of sand felt like it was uh, a big thing. But after a while, we'd be running around, come back home, look, there's something stuck in our foot. We didn't even notice because we were so used to it. And then it started all over again in the winter. We'd put shoes on and it started all over the next summer. So that said, patience is one of the things and knowing that there's nothing wrong, this is normal. There are some things that you can do and the first that you should know about is that the steel string guitar is the most painful. It's because these little metal things are cutting into your fingers and they cause the most pain. Now, one of the things you could do is try to adjust your guitar and make it a little easier. I usually have students at the physical music school get lighter strings on the guitar to make it easier at first, partly because it is easier to play and it won't take so much muscle. And as they progress, they get more muscle. So it kind of balances out. But also it's easier on the fingers and it won't be so painful. What happens, unfortunately, is a lot of students, because it's painful, don't want to practice. Well, they don't practice and the fingers don't get tough. And this goes on until they either quit or it just drags on for a long time and it finally works itself out. So I want them to practice, even if it means with lighter strings. One of the things that helps is they make the string called silk and steel. The silk and steel string 
is a kind of a hybrid between metal and nylon. It's softer. It's easier on the fingers. It doesn't sound as good, at least to me. And I think most guitar players would agree with me, at least uh, compared to the acoustic guitar sound. It's not as bright, but it's worth the, uh, the loss in sound to just get your fingers accustomed to playing on the guitar. And then, of course, you, over time, you can change the different strings. At the bare minimum, put the lightest gauge acoustic strings you can on, and that will help. Um, also, uh, I've, I've, I've read things about uh, people who salt their fingers and put crazy glue on the tips of their fingers and all that. I don't know about that. And I just want to say that in case you've heard all that. I've never tried any of those things. And I'm skeptical, quite frankly. Uh, but I won't make a judgment on it since I haven't tried it. Um, finally, practice in short segments, but keep practicing. If it hurts, try to, you know, at first do lots of little five minute sessions instead of one half hour and bear through it and, and then come back at it three days later and then kind of start over. The repetition on your fingers tends to work better to get them tougher faster than uh, doing a lot and then waiting a long time. Okay, uh, feel free if you're online to uh, join in too, if, um, if you want to add to the question. I'll try and go through the questions that were submitted ahead of time. But if I see a question come up that's related, I'll try to jump to that too. So let me take a quick look. By the way, it would help me. This is because I'm kind of doing several things at once. If you have a question, if you could put in big letters question, because then I glance over and I see question, I can get to that as opposed to a comment or something else. Just a suggestion. It'll help me see it better and I'll get to your question faster. So I'm looking now and, uh, hey there, uh, good to see so many people on live. Wonderful. I'm imagining more people are at home than usual at this time of day. Uh, okay, let me uh, get on to the next question. Paul says, I've been to lounge performances where there is a person playing acoustic guitar and singing along with some type of tracks, uh, instrumental tracks, the, basically the rest of the band. He calls it a song minus the guitar and voice. Um, what type of equipment are they using? I wouldn't mind having something like this. It'd be fun to use at home. I agree. And um, I do something like this at home. I'm, I don't usually sing professionally. I reserve that for my family and friends. But... Um, I do, I have performed a lot with background tracks. So first of all, let me start with just saying what I do, and then I'll make some suggestions around that. I use a sound system, a PA system, uh, a PA public address, just, it's basically a mixer with an amp and speakers. And I have the tracks on my iPhone, and I plug that in. Then I play them on my iPhone. And then I have my guitar plugged in to the same mixer. There's volume control so I can adjust the balance. And then I'll play my guitar along with it. If I were singing, which I do actually have a microphone hooked up as well, same thing with a volume control and I can adjust the sound. So I press the button, the tracks, the band starts. I call it the band in the box. It's, it's my iPhone with the tracks. And then I would start playing. I use the microphone for announcements and for uh, talking mostly. But uh, if you were singing, you'd use it for that. So I made a little chart. I read this question ahead of time. And I, let me see if it, it comes out. I have to get close here. Yeah, I think it's a, or it doesn't look backwards or something. It looks backwards on my screen. Uh, upside down too. Let's try that. Yeah, it's backwards, huh? Oh, that's kind of weird. Okay. Anyway, I hope you can make it out. That's my rough drawing of a mixer and amp. Together, by the way, you can get the mixer and the amp as separate. I, for simplicity, I carry something that has the mixer and the amp all built in one thing. And the speakers separately, the iPhone you see going in and the mic and the guitar go plugged in and you adjust them with little volume controls. So I probably could make a, at least a copy of that. Or if I have time, I'll draw a little better one and put it on the blog post after this. Um, a lot of... Uh, I would say a lot of people are doing it at home. Instead of getting speakers, a sound system that has speakers and a mixer and amp, they would get one thing, uh, basically an acoustic guitar amplifier that had the kind of the mixer, the amp built in, plus a speaker. It would be uh, less expensive and more portable. I put it all together because I need a, a bigger sound to cover 
you know, for when I'm playing in clubs or for private events, I need the space. And the reason they use two speakers is to cover more space and basically to not sound really loud up close and nothing way far back. So you need speakers high in the air and spread apart. But for home, I'd have one guitar amplifier, acoustic guitar amp. I do have such a thing. And it just has a small little mixer with a few inputs. I think mine has three, but even two would work. Just one for the mic and one for the... Uh, oh, you would need a, uh, one for the iPhone going in. Usually they have a separate one for that. And then one for your mic and one for the guitar. And it has a speaker built in. There are many on the market, all the way from, you know, a hundred bucks up to... A, thousand or so for mine cost around a thousand but i would say probably two or three hundred you can get a decent one maybe even a couple hundred now and uh if you want uh just shoot me a, a quick message and i'd be glad to make some suggestions i think i even did that for somebody and i'll i'll look in my notes and see if i can come up with that i did some research and found what i thought was the best right now it changes as technology does so the amp that i use right now i probably buy a different one. I like the Fishman brand, and I I have one that uh, is not Fishman. And Fishman makes a range from a couple two three hundred dollars up to thousand dollars full PA systems, couple thousand even. Um, to get the tracks, um, I when I made my I recorded many CDs. I play my own music, and when I perform. I had them in the studio make me a version of the CD at the same time and take out the guitar, the main guitar. So it, it would take me a lot of money and time to record whole CDs with no guitar separately. But when we made the CD, if you just press a button and make another copy without the guitar, no big thing, right? Um, for you, it, obviously, you don't have your own CD that you can do that. Um, a lot of uh, times you can find karaoke uh, songs and play along with them. Now, I've never done that, but it's, I think that's what I would do if I were trying to find music and uh, play along with it. Karaoke music is basically the music without the voice. And you could, you know, whether they have the guitar or not, they might have versions without a, a guitar part as well. Uh, a little tricky, I'm sure, because there's all the issues like what key it's in and, and what the actual guitar part is that you're supposed to be playing. Um, I wouldn't I have never had to do that, so I don't have any tips on sorting all that out. But what I have done, and I do a lot for myself, is I just get a, a, a software on my computer and I record like a rhythm guitar and um, I'll put in a bass line. I can play the bass. And then I'll make a track and jam along with it. I have a great time doing that. It's enough like the band, but I put it in the key and, and exactly the chord progression that I want. One piece of software that I highly recommend, if you're willing to do just a little bit of work and learn how to use it, is Band in a Box. It is software that it's a, I think it's amazing. You basically put what chord you want and then what style, and it will put the instruments and bass line and everything in there. It has pre-recorded tracks. It's amazing to me, it, and it sounds great. It's uh, something that takes a little bit of learning how to use it right, but I I have great fun with that. And I can quickly make a, a track with a chord progression. I don't have to even play the rhythm guitar, and then I can jam along with it, and I have a great time. You could sing as well. There's no uh, vocals. So band in the box, and I can put a link to that in the blog post as well. Um, let's see. Question. Oh, you guys jumped right on this. Uh, let's see. I want to check and make sure there's nothing specifically related. Okay. Um, some great questions here, and I'm going to get them. Thank you. This is working. See, I, my eyes go right to the question. Let me answer the uh, another question or two that was submitted uh, before, and then I'll get to some of these questions live. I. This is from Shilami. I have watched some rhythm guitarists who during uh, parts of the song seem to play open chords up in the upper part of the neck. Sometimes there's a transition between chords. I know how to play bar chords all up and down the neck, but what the heck are they doing? No, she didn't say that. She said, what are these open chords that they're playing? Well, this is a, a style of playing that is less common. I don't spend a lot of time teaching it, but um, it it is something that... Um, 
I think it's fun to experiment with. Basically, there are open chords in even in your regular standard tuning that you can play like something like that that sound good by themselves. And there, I don't have any specific forms I would say right now. I'd say try taking your open chords and moving them up and see where they sound good. Right there sounds good. Sounds a little tense. It could be good as a passing. So I'm, I'm playing these open strings, the low and the high and the, the B or second string, and then I'm making an E form chord. I, I like that. That's a exotic sound chord. That sounds good. It's a little tense. Could work in just like quickly on the way to another one. That sounds great. And you'll find the same thing with A. a. Um, D works also, but you, you don't want to hit all the strings necessarily. So another style that I use uh, up and down the neck is what I call baby chords. They're little three note chords and uh, you can make a D version. I call this a G version, even though it's not a G once you move it up. Now it's an A. It's just three notes. And the D is just the D moved around. And then the other one is a C version. Again, it's not really a C. I'll call it a C form, I should say. Because as you move it up, it's a different chord. It is C here. Now it's D. You can combine them together. So here's a combination. That sounded good <laughs> over the internet. I know the sound can get a little uh, muddled sometimes coming through the uh, streaming thing, but um, that's a good place to start. This is not the only, and uh, I'm sure if I experiment a little bit more, I could come up with a lot. It's not a technique I use a lot, so I don't have extensive experience with that. But those are good places to start. I think the baby chords are the easiest to get started with. And uh, I do teach some lessons in the real guitar success using baby chords in the practice plan. Um, a D chord, a G chord, which is basically a, just a three note version of this bar G. I'm barring these two notes. And then the C form, which is a, basically a three note version of this chord. First finger and the third and pinky together on the third string and second string. I'm on the third fret and the fifth with my pinky and third finger. Okay, hope that helps you to meet. And of course, uh, I'm sure you'll ask some more questions if, if you have some ideas. Um, let me answer a few online questions to get started here. Mm, 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 mm. Question, question. Where's the first one? Question. Will bar chords get easier? I'm trying to stay with it, but I, I but my left hand has tendonitis. I have hand finger exerciser that I'm using to get stronger and a new ice pack. Welcome to the club, Tim. Believe me, I have heard some version of this for 40 years now. <laughs> yes, they will get easier, um, but only if you persist. And in general, I would say you have to be patient and um, do a little at a time. The biggest problem with bar chords, and I'm sure if everybody seems to uh, do this, so it's it's not a bad thing, will tend to do bar chords when they come up in a song or when we think it's time to learn the first bar chord. Usually the F chord comes up first. <laughs> so you really had a disadvantage because first of all, the F chord is probably one of the harder bar chords, not the hardest, but certainly on the harder side because of where it is. Next to this nut, there's more tension. Well, up in here, it's easier to press down the strings. You've got a lot of lead way there, but here you're really close to that nut. And the other thing is, there you've jumped into something that's totally different than what you've been doing. And that leap is big and people don't realize it. They see people doing it. Wow, it looks easy. Yeah, I can do that. Or I should be able to do that. That's easy with their thinking. I can't, but I should be able to do that. Just struggle through it. Well, and, and 
And what they do to struggle through it is they kind of tense their hand and get a little bit of a weird wrist position to try and make it work and get the strings to sound right, causing pain, wrist problems, fingers problems, uh, bad habits, which are harder to break later on. Here's my main advice. Back up. Start working on bar chords a little at a time. Um, if you're a member of Real Guitar Success, go to my Bar Chords for Everyone course. If you're not and you don't want to be a member, at least just purchase the course separately. I broke things down step by step. If you don't want to purchase anything, go on YouTube and find Bar Chords exercises and make your own program step by step. Start with the basic stuff. Start with partial bar chords. I start students with this kind of thing, which is not an actual bar. It's, it's part of the chord. And so they learn to move up and down, and they learn to get the finger in the right place. Start adding a finger at a time. They practice the bar separately. Then they put them together. This happens step by step, along with some exercises and songs to get used to it a little at a time. That's a much different scenario than jumping right in and just trying to struggle through the harder bar chords. By the way, at least start with more like a, a bar chord up in this area as opposed to the F chord and, and get used to those before you try to play the F bar chord. The the harder bar chord, which is very useful, is an actual B bar chord because this is a little bit harder. Or some people play it like this, depending. I do like this on a nylon string guitar. I do it like this on a, a electric guitar or acoustic. That's even harder than the F chord. And those are the two most useful bar chords because you can't really play a good F or a good B without some type of bar. And, you know, you can play kind of a simplified version. So I empathize with you. Um, you're not alone. This is normal. <sighs> Try to back up some version, uh, make your own program or, or sign up for a, a very step-by-step -step course that'll break you into bar chords instead of just jumping, kind of like starting from the ground, trying to jump to a top of a two-story building. It's just unrealistic. If you had a step-by-step -step ladder, it'd be easy, but to just jump in one single bound uh, and keep trying harder and harder, it's it's just going to break your legs if you were trying to jump up a two-story building. So I, I empathize with you. Keep at it little by little. Next question. I'm having trouble learning chord triads on top strings. Any help you can give me? Um, Mark. Oh, no, that's Colin. Colin. Mm, I don't know exactly what that means. It could mean triads are these baby, what I call baby chords, because they are three note. Triad means three note. And these are three note chords. And um, if that's the case, I would suggest uh, picking one and practicing it and moving it around and then adding another and try going from one to the other. What I, I do in, in my Real Guitar Success programs, I make little progressions and have the student work on one chord at a time, add another chord, and then practice it slowly and speed it up until they can transition. This is a good uh, pattern, by the way, because it sounds good. I put some rhythm to it, but first start simple. And it uses the three most common triads in the upper strings. I hope this is what you're talking about. If not, please uh, clarify a little bit more in the, um, what do you call this? Chat, <laughs> in the chat. So thanks for the question, Colin. Um, I would be happy to talk more about that. Now, let me um, answer another question that was submitted ahead of time so I don't lose track of those. Hmm. Ah, well, okay. I'm good. I'm okay. Let me read the question. I am wanting to learn some hand percussive techniques for fingerstyle on steel string guitar. I'm learning a finger uh, tap technique. Any tips would be great. Um, and then her second part of the question, do you think a pick up, a pickup would be helpful to do this or needed to do this because of techniques. Well, uh, Pat, Pat, I, I am not, I don't know. I don't do those techniques. I've never done finger tap. I have seen many on electric guitar and I know the amplification does help. Now I read this question ahead of time and I went ahead and um, did just a little research on my own. And I found a couple of great videos. It really kind of inspired me. Um, 
I'm going to get put links to those in my blog post. And one of them is kind of like a how-do. It's broken down more simply. And it's, it, he shows what it sounds like. And I thought that was wonderful. He's using open tuning. And that's the one thing I can see. It would work much better with open tuning or a tuning that when you play chords up in here, it sounds good. As opposed to standard tuning, it tends to be harder to find chords up and around the neck that sound good. Um, it wouldn't work for me because I have um, nails on my right hand. And... For the styles I play, especially the flamenco styles, I need those nails. And I don't think I could tap with nails on. I might be wrong. There might be somebody who, who knows a way to do that. But I, am, I, I wouldn't try it without some clear instruction. I certainly wouldn't want to break my nails. I need them. Um, I'll put links to these two videos. The other one's by Justin King. And he's just super impressive. I think that video is more inspirational than real instruction. But Justin King apparently is somebody really good in that field. Uh, good question, and uh, I'm glad I looked it up. It was really inspiring and interesting. Uh, so next question. I need some advice to play difficult songs with a fast tempo. Yes, I think we all do. I especially have difficulty changing from open chords to bar chords. Mm. And because I'm playing in church and I need to take my eyes off of the sheet music to uh, change chords, but then I'm lost on the sheet music. Yeah, that makes sense. How should I train to do this? And so perhaps practicing a song so well it, that you know it so well that you don't have to take your eyes off the music. Um, yes, certainly that that's a great suggestion. Uh, the other thing that I would say is I've had to play a lot of gigs where I had to pay attention to sheet music, including in church, but also in clubs, because I was a, a hired gun. And I had to um, basically they'd give me a usually a fairly rough chart and say, you know, go. <laughs> That's pretty much it. And the trick is to do that is to, and, and assuming that you haven't had time to really kind of just memorize the song and not have to look at the sheet music, is to, first of all, glance at, look for any surprises or tricks. Uh, I learned from a drummer friend of mine, he would go through the marker and mark where like some repeats are things that are going to throw him off. If he, if he kind of glanced away, he'd, he'd keep going when he should have went back to the beginning. So we'd mark a big yellow um, repeat here. You know, he'd put a big line, double line and a couple other things like that. I don't remember all the things that he used, but I learned to, if I have to read music to make a few markings that makes sense to me. And then I would, I learned over time to watch the measures and always keep ahead. When I'm looking at the sheet music, I'm not looking and playing the bar. I'm looking two bars ahead. And I had to train myself to do that. It took time. I'm looking two bars ahead. So I kind of quickly glance at the bar I'm playing. I got that. And I'm looking ahead. And I keep glancing. So if I did have to look quickly at something, I'm still way ahead. I'm not going to lose my place. That said, it takes practice. There's, there's no quick you know, tip that you just look at music and all of a sudden you can do it because you know this trick. It takes practice. And the more you know the song, the easier it gets. And the more variety of songs you play, the easier it gets when something new comes up. Going from bar chords to open chords, by the way, is a place that you need some help. And I would recommend practicing it separately, just practicing some exercises, going from bar chords to open chords, back and forth. I, I'll, If I remember, I'll look up a video that I made with some instruction on that. And I gave some sample exercises that are good using more common changes. There are some open chords that, to bar chord changes that are more common than others. Depending on the complexity of music, so, you know, to some degree, um, you, you have to get better at going from any bar chord to open chord. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the chat and answer some more questions online. Okay, Tom, hey. <laughs> good to see you, Tom. Yeah, I haven't seen you for a while. I guess um, I, this time works if you're staying at home, huh? With bar chords, sometimes my other fingers can't reach the position they should go to, no matter how I hard I stretch. Hmm. Will that get better with practice somehow? Um, I would say it probably, I, I wish I knew which bar chord. That would be, you know, a, a good example. For example, I, I have this bar chord that I had to work on for quite a while. And matter of fact, I haven't played it in a while. So let's see how it goes. Can you guys see that stretch? A beautiful chord. I do it on a nylon string, and it is actually even more of a stretch because the neck's a little bit wider, a little easier on the steel string guitar. And I finger pick it, so um, I have to get every note right. I can't just strum and slop through some of the notes. Um, one thing that might help is some 
stretching exercises. And I do have a video. Uh, you're a member of Real Guitar Success, so I, I have a whole uh, program. I would do, if I were you, because I know you're probably in my age range, we need to do finger stretching exercise. Matter of fact, I need to do back stretching every day as well. It really has made a big difference. It's finger stretching a little every day. And you can integrate it into your practice, start before, but I also do a few stringer, finger stretches in the morning, just as my normal warm-up exercise routine. And I think that would help uh, equally as just trying to bang through the bar cord. Finally, though, I do want to say there are some, it's likely there are some so, small changes in your hand position that would help. I couldn't say without seeing your hand. And even then, it's so personalized. I could only say, try this, try this, try this. And you would give feedback and say, yeah, that works a little bit better. Try experimenting a little bit. Don't count on one thing to just magically work. But consider making little adjustments, see if it helps, along with stretching. It'll be hard to tell which one worked, but in this case, I, I don't think it has to be a scientific experiment. And work it a little bit each day, maybe you know five minutes a day. Try not to spend hours on it and just get sore and then not want to come back at it for a month. I'm exaggerating, but that's I've done that more than once. Tried so hard to do something, it was so painful. I found myself avoiding it without even thinking about it. And that's one of the things I've learned is to treat my subconscious mind with respect. If something is so painful, it's likely I'll find myself avoiding working on it, even, even though consciously I say I should do that. So keep that in mind. Uh, hope that helps. Let's go on to the next question for now. Mm, question, question, question. What angle of your fingers to make chords without hitting the next string is correct? What angle? Um, let's see. How can I answer that? Um, every chord's different. In, I guess I should say, in general, it you you want to try to get an angle with your fingers that are as much as possible goes up and then back down, as opposed to angling off to a side. Um, it's easier with some chords than others. Obviously, when you stretch across the neck, I can't get this one completely up and down. I have to go like this. So each chord's a little bit different, and I would. If I were you, I, I don't know what level you are, but if you're in the early stages, I would take a few chords at a time and try to get them and then add chords a little time. If you have, if you get overwhelmed with kind of the information side and learning many chords, you tend not to have time to get the little subtleties right and it catches up to you. Everything sounds kind of crappy, quite frankly. Try to limit it so that you can focus on getting the notes right. Not perfect. Never go for perfect. You'll get stuck. But, you know, go for getting it better and limiting the amount of choices of things that you're working on to get the chords sounding good and then add more chords as you go. Simpler exercises, simpler songs, practice exercises, not just songs. People I see all the time, they just want to play songs, but they, they're so caught up in the whole song, they can't really focus on getting the little details right. And they don't do them enough. If the If this change comes up and you're trying to work on it, but it only comes up twice in the song. You have to go through the whole song every time to get there. It's it's a, a slow boat. Work on some exercises along with songs for fun. Um, okay, next question. I am a member of Real Guitar Success, but we don't talk a lot about names of notes and reading music in the lessons. Will this hold me back down the road? Uh, Tim. <laughs> Good choice, <laughs> member of Real Guitar Success. Thanks for telling me that. It does help. Um, no, and I used to. I, I'm I am classically trained, uh, for better or worse. Um, actually, I, I think in some ways it uh, it got me in a little bit of a box, but I quickly broke out of that uh, college. Um, the classical training. The reason I say that is that I had strong. I had to learn to read music and it was uh, drilled into my head. That's the way you play guitar. Classical guitarists read music and usually pretty well if they're good classical guitarists. Uh, when you're playing folk style and all, that's not really necessary because you're usually following chord changes. It is very helpful to be able to look at a chord chart well and, and um, be able to quickly distinguish the fingering for chords, but not so much for reading the notes. The reason I backed away from note reading is I found for most people, it's a little bit like going around the block three times to get across the street. Um, they're just not 
going to read notes enough to get good at it, and it always becomes a little bit of a sore spot. It's because a lot of the folk style, being able to play songs and, and any kind of pop rock folk, blues, guitar, there's just not a lot that's actually written note-wise. And that ones that are written note-wise, the music has a rhythm, especially blues uh, and jazz, has rhythm things that make it very hard it's a, an advanced note reading, in other words. So to get there would take a long time to be able to read blues, uh, flamenco, and, and jazz by reading the actual notes. So I have opted to go with tab more, and I have a whole course, the second adventure on reading tab, and I strongly recommend going through that. It's, it's a quick one. Um, it'll serve you well throughout all of the learning that you do from then on. And I deal with uh, tab up in this area, but you can apply everything, you know, as you move up the neck too. It's a great foundation, much better than I had. When I first learned tab, it was kind of like, here's how it works, go. <laughs> um, so I practice with exercise and all using the tab. That said, there are some value to reading notes. And I recommend everyone learn the names of the notes all around the neck and practice so that you can get to a note and learn. G, G, G. G, because a lot of the things that you do may not require an actual note reading, but when you play chords, bar chords, movable chords is what I'm trying to say, or scales that move up and down the neck, you need to know what where you're starting from. So if I want a B scale, it's movable, easy. I want a B major scale. Well, I go right there, because I know that's a B note. If I didn't know that was a B note, I, I couldn't really make use of that movable scale. I want the A scale, same scale. I just need to know what the notes are. <coughs> and there are tricks for that. Um, I, am, I am actually, right now, I've already recorded some videos and I have a plan to record the next videos, making a course in Real Guitar Success for just that. And I have a single video and that might be a good place to start, but I'm making a whole course because I found with a video, it was some good tips, but I didn't give people a way to actually kind of digest the information and work it. So the course will have it broken down to like seven or eight lessons and work on the different tricks and then put them all together at the end so that you can quickly learn the names of the notes uh, all up and down the neck, memorize basically the fretboard. And it's not just the actual name I'm after. What I'm after is that you recognize the sound, G, you hear a G note and you hear it, you can tell that's a G note and you have to move around the neck to hear the, that those are all G notes up and down the neck. The listening part is, I think, often not talked about enough. And I think really good players spend less time thinking about what they're doing and more time kind of listening to get the sound that they want up and down the neck. Those things can come together. They don't have to be like one or the other. And that's what my course aimed to do is kind of inspire you to intellectually learn the names of the notes because that's, us adults like something intellectual to grab onto. But at the same time, I'm working that you get practice listening to the notes and being able to identify the sound in your head that I want that dun, and hear it. Dun. There, I got it. It took a sec. Huh? Okay. I, I, I hope that helps. Coming soon. It always takes longer than I think. I think I can record this in a week, but um, it'll take another week or so for the editors and everybody and to put it together on the website. Um, but I'll try to remember to at least give you the link to the one video that's on Real Guitar Success on the tips um, uh, to just get started. Um, by the way, if you really do want to read music, you want to play classical guitar, or you want to sight read for some reason, um, I, I actually did make a course for that. And let me know, give me a, a separate email because not a lot of people ask for that. And I don't want to spend time on that and take it. I'd have to take the time away from doing something else, but I'd be glad to figure out a way to get you access to that course, uh, just as part of real guitar success. It's, um, I think it's a little old and I'm not terribly anxious to make it public. I'd like to redo it someday, but then that's kind of on my list just for those people who are either curious or want to read notes, uh, as a, a foundation for if they want to play classical guitar or uh, do something that involves sight reading. Um, thanks, Tim. You can tell I like talking about that. Um, question, JVJ plus. Okay. My strumming patterns don't sound good. How, to, how do I make them sound good, especially the upstrokes? When playing all strings like E, G, 
I think he's saying when you play chords, you use all the strings. Yes, uh, commonly, when you're first starting, it's easier to get the downstrokes to sound good. And the upstrokes sound a little rough. The main trick there is, uh, technique-wise, is to angle your hands slightly. As you go down, angle it so the pick's slightly up, not like that, just slightly up. And then on the way up, it goes, your wrist turns the other way. So I'm going like this. Now you notice I'm using my whole arm to make this pendulum motion. Down, up, down, up. But I'm twisting my wrist to make the pick motion. Now the other thing you have to be careful for is brush the strings. Don't dig in too hard. I used to play a lot like that when I, I wasn't too experienced with a pick. And it doesn't sound good. So practice that. And finally, go with some simple exercises to do that. Don't just try to think that out and use it in songs. There's too much going on. You're not likely to get very good at it very quickly. I think the tips will help. But if you want to make some progress, practice some simple chord changes with a slow strum. Maybe even use a metronome. So let's take a basic strum. Down, down, up, down, up. And practice that motion. Maybe with just one other chord. And then start picking it up. Because the faster it goes, the harder it will be to actually intellectually remember to move your hand. You want to get to where it's a habit. So you don't think about it. Your hand just goes. Okay. I think that's enough on that for right now. Let's go on to another question. Good. Oh, JV's also asking if you can uh, give us some good strumming patterns. Well, um, I would, if you're having a hard time up strumming, I would stay away from too many strumming patterns. See, that's a mistake people make is they go after numbers of chords or numbers of strumming patterns to kind of measure how well they're going. And I think it's a mistake. I think it's okay to learn some strumming patterns, but the main issue is getting a smooth strum. This simple strum pattern, right? This is probably one of the most basic strum patterns. Down, down, up, down, up, down, up. I could play it like this. And that's what I hear a lot of beginners doing. Except they're not quite uh, even up and down there. So, and then they change chords and it's even worse on the change. Practice that strum pattern, first of all, with one chord and then add just one other chord. So that it sounds smooth to start. Slowly and then pick it up. Then, here's what I would do. Instead of adding a different pattern, learn to make that pattern more interesting. What I mean by that is learn to hit the lower string sometime and the upper string sometime. Listen to this. Down, down, up, down, up. That's not bad. I'm playing it smoothly, right? But now listen to this. Right? Much better. What I'm doing is I'm deliberately hitting sometimes the lower strings and on the upper strings. It doesn't have to be an exact formula, but I did make a lesson giving a formula just to give you something to work on, but you can change it up to, and even have a few varieties. But the idea is to get control of your picking hand. Then when you add a pattern, here's a different pattern. Down, down, up, up, up down, up. I skipped one of the, the downs, down. Common Eagles strumming pattern, hot rock I call it. So that pattern sounds much better if because I, I have a little finesse with my right hand. And again, it doesn't sound good. If it sounds like that, you probably need to work on a, a simpler pattern more. Hope that helps. Hope uh, I hope you're not too disappointed about, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i the same way. It's, it's easier to kind of see your progress. If you can say, I know this many patterns or this many songs, or this many chords. But I also see that with especially people in the early learning stages, causing them a lot of problems. They're not really focusing on things that will get them a better sound. And I was right there with everybody else uh, in, in the earlier stages. Actually, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this, uh, it's, it applies to sports, martial arts, many things. Often the advanced students go back and really work on the basics, even 
more often. I've heard over and over, good basketball players just work on a basic free throw. And I know martial artists work on their basic punches, trying to get them even better. Um, I would recommend taking that to heart, even from the early stages. Okay, now uh, I think we're getting close to the end of the questions. I see one more. Um, and I hope I didn't miss anybody's question. I'm looking down, looking for question. If you forgot to put question and I didn't answer your question. Oh, here is one. Richard, I see question. On light strings, I use them and I wonder if there, there's an advantage to going heavier. Um, that's a great question, actually, because uh, that is something I can answer. Uh, you might want to, first of all, I'll say this. It's okay to try going back and forth and seeing what happens. In general, there's not a big advantage going heavier strings. But if you are playing and singing and you're not using amplification, it is easier to play louder with heavier strings. The other reason heavier strings sometimes are good is lighter strings tend to buzz a lot. And if you're uh, miking your guitar, the heavier strings, uh, the buzzing won't show up so much. And what I mean is when you hit harder on the frets, on when you hit strum harder is what I'm trying to say. Um, all that said, especially in the early stages, I think the advantage of having lighter strings is, is more than having a louder sound. It is a little harder, I think, just slightly to get a smooth sound with heavier strings, but uh, only slightly. A, a competent guitarist could put really heavy strings and get a nice smooth sound, no problem. Mm, all said and done, um, you can experiment and try heavier strings and see how they feel to you. Most guitars come with what we call light strings. Acoustic guitar goes like this, extra light, light, and medium. I, I've never seen heavy. They might have them somewhere, but most brands don't call them heavies. And they have these hybrid, different kind of light bottoms and heavy tops and vice versa. So most guitars come with this middle gauge. They call it light gauge. Uh, if you're starting out, a lot of guitars, I prefer them to have extra light just to make it easier, uh, softer on their fingers and easier to get a strum. Uh, the medium would be what you'd call a heavier gauge. And it's if you're using, you've been playing for a while and you're using light gauge, it, it'd be fine to go ahead and try mediums and see what you think. See if it's worth it for you, the louder volume and um, maybe a little punchier notes. And it's, it's a sound, I'm, I can't think of the words to explain, but it's subtle. I doubt you'll see a big difference. Good question. Okay, let me go one more time. Make sure I, I didn't miss anybody that put big question in there. Oh, uh, question, please talk about the surf technique, uh, Dick Dales. Um, I've never played surf music. Um, uh, Ayush, I, I think that's how you say your name, Ayush. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So I couldn't honestly talk about that. I, I would be out of my, my depth there. Surf music is not uh, something I've ever ventured into. Sorry about that. Uh, and let me look. Uh, question, when... When to change strings? Oh, that's a great question. Um, is there a specific time to do it or wait until it snaps? Uh, no, no, wait until it snaps. I'll say no. <laughs> Try to do it. Uh, uh, snapping is not always related to, not often related to having old strings. I've had guitars with strings on there, sit in the closet for years and the strings still don't snap, but they sound horrible. What happens when you put your uh, strings on your guitar over time, the sound is deteriorating, particularly on the high end. The crispness is deteriorating, actually very quickly. I, I can tell the difference in one day of, of playing my guitar. It depends how much you play. The more you play, the faster it happens. What's mostly happening is there's oil in your fingers. It's getting on the strings. And as the oil gets into the strings, it tends to slightly corrode the strings, acid in the oil in your fingers. Some people have more than others, so the strings corrode faster. Um, the more you play, the more likely they're gonna, that's going to happen. The more acid you have in your just general body composition, the more quickly that's going to happen. So even if you leave your guitar sitting down, they're still going to corrode. It just happens faster with that uh, oil from your fingers. If you change your guitar strings um, every year, you're going to be playing for a long time with strings that really have lost a lot of high end, a lot of crispness. And if you're only playing once in a while and you don't care, okay, that's fine. For me, I. I lose, in, I want to be inspired by myself. When I play something good, I want it to sound good. So I would, I would change on the, like an average playing, playing a little bit most days of the week. I would change strings every three to six months in that area, depending on uh, which strings you're using. By the way, um, 
on acoustic guitar, there are Foster Bronze and regular bronze strings. The Foster Bronze tend to last longer, the tone lasts longer. The uh, regular bronze strings are brighter at first, but the brightness goes away faster too. Um, and so if you're using Foster Bronze, you can go a little longer. Uh, I've had strings on this guitar for over five months now. It's probably time to change them. It's not critical. Um, I know people who change them in the area of once a year. If you do break a string, it's likely for a variety of reasons, the string could be slightly faulty or you. what's happening is you're hitting on the fret a lot and it's den getting dented in that place. But also probably, you know, a lot of times people who aren't smooth as strumming, they'll hit the strings a little hard and they'll break. Change all the strings unless they you just change them within the last week or so. It's really noticeable when you you break a string, you put one new string on and the rest are old. Now you hear the difference is more noticeable than just the overall dying away. The other thing I found too is when you leave strings on the guitar for a long time, you kind of get used to that sound. You don't realize how much the tone is dying. And you put new strings on and you say, wow, that's what the guitar could sound like. So if you think your guitar is not sound that great, change strings first before you go out and spend another $500 to get a better guitar. At least see what it sounds like with good strings on it. Good question. Let's go on. Okay, I think I got them all now. Uh, I went back and hit the ones that I, I think I missed. And now I'm going towards the end. Yeah, somebody says um, about changing strings before they sound dead. That's a, that is a term we use for strings that the, the high end is gone. They sound dead. Ah, Dora is asking about a different time signatures for different uh, different strums for different time signatures. Um, good question, Dora. By far, the main time signatures are four four time, which is one two three four, and three four time. One two three one two three. Now I also use something that would be considered a six eight time. That would be like six beats one two three four five six. But really, I feel it in two pulses, and each pulse has three beats. So it, there is a difference. One two three four five six one. See the answers on one and four. One. I'll even count it sometimes. Just as one two. One, two. If you're starting out, I would go for the four, four, and three, four. Just start with this basic one, two, and three, and four, and, and work at getting it smooth and with a little character. Then start adding some fancy uh, aspects to the strum. Uh, same with the three, four, only you do three beats. One, two, and three. So you can do a lot with just that, one, but with some subtleties. Listen. One. It's much different than one, two, three. Now, the other strum I would practice in the beginning, because this will have repercussions later, is a bass strum. That's this. Bass, strum, strum. Or you can add a down up. Two, three, one. Any version of down ups. One, two, three. Same with four, four. One, two, three, four. The reason is, when you start playing music where you add bass notes to it, it's good to get used to knowing what bass note to play for each of the chords. And I recommend students when they're beginning to always make the chord from the bottom up. What that means is to try and get the bass note first, even if it's just a very fraction of a second first, because when you're changing from one chord to another, that's what you'll hear first. That's where you're the strumming, whether you're hitting the bass note or strumming down, that's what you'll hear first. So that gets you practicing hitting the bass note and getting to that bass note quickly, as opposed to making a chord this way, high strings. That would be the opposite from the high to the low. From the bottom up means bass note first. Now for the six eight strum, just do like a double three four, but put the kind of the emphasis on one and four. One, two, three, four. So again, a basic six eight strum would be A little finesse, it sounds like this. Now, what I was doing there is I wasn't just trying to hit the bass note, but I was hitting in the low end. If I accidentally hit the fifth string as well, I didn't care, but it adds some movement, some variety. Bass, drums, 
high bass, high, high bass, high, high bass. And I'm hitting the highest strings, the two or three strings in the high. This is more valuable than just learning different techniques of strums. And all of all the techniques of strums, in other words, the different uh, versions of when to go down and when to go up, are much easier once you get those basics. Um, I like to add some techniques called a dampening. And this is a technique that I would learn probably next after working on this. Dampening means um, hitting the chord, but I'm releasing it so it makes that sound. Listen. Or here's the one. Great example. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier with bar chords because when I when I play bar chords and I release them, all the notes dampen. So it's a technique in many strums, and I would start working on it. You can see it is much more valuable when you play bar chords. Let me try it with the open G chord. Oh, here's a basic rock song. Okay, what I'm having to do is not only release my fingers, but kind of flatten them to dampen the string because there's open strings. So that muting technique, you want to work on that first and then add it to a strum. It's basically mute the fingers in the left hand, mute the chord, either flatten them out or in bar chord, just release it and then put it back. That's a good exercise to practice. You could use the song Obladi Oblada Oblady Obla. Oh, see, it's a... There it is. Yeah, a little hard to play because really what I'm doing there is I find sometimes naturally I go to muting with this palm as well because the open strings like a D, I can't cover all the strings. And again, with bar chords, it works better. You can see it kind of depends on a few things and depends on where you're at uh, developmentally wise. If you're already playing bar chords, no problem. Okay, that was a lot for <laughs> what I thought was a fairly simple question. And let's see, any more questions? What is your Yamaha guitar story? What's your gear preference? Hmm, Mr. Pesky. No, let's see. Yes, Mr. Pesky. Um, well, my Yamaha guitar story. My Yamaha guitar, this guitar was born in Japan. And um, I, I really like this guitar. I saw it at a trade show. Uh, I, I own a music store, so I get to go to the trade show every year. Uh, for better or worse, it was exciting at first. It's a, a little draining right now after 30 something years. But uh, I saw this at the trade show and I get the advantage of trying out things, you know, that, uh, that most people would have to go to the store and, and make an extra trip. And I love the guitar and bought it. And I'm really happy that I did. I have other Yamaha guitars. My store has a Yamaha dealership. So, uh, of course, I tend towards Yamaha guitars. I'm going to get uh, a really good discount on them. but not only that, there's a lot of bang for buck in Yamaha. And that's one of the reasons that we got that dealership. You get a lot of guitar for the money. I, I love Taylor's and I love Martin guitars, but you pay an extra premium just for that. The idea of having a Taylor or Martin over and above the actual quality compared to a Yamaha guitar. Yamaha doesn't have quite that same premium difference. Uh, this guitar um, is a slightly smaller body and it has a cutaway, so if I want to play up in here, it's a little easier. It's an acoustic electric, and it also, and this did attract me, has a really good pickup in it, a nice pickup system. It has this kind of balance between uh, two different pickups that make it sound, uh, you can blend the acoustic and the more electromagnetic pickup, and uh, it's really great for playing live. That said, my main guitar is a nylon string guitar, or several I have, and um, uh, that's where I spend most of my time. They're handmade guitars. I prefer, uh, I found makers for guitars and I have several different handmade guitars. 
much more expensive than any of these. This is, you know, a, a $1,500 guitar. My handmade guitars are you know, $8,000. Um, uh, one of them's down in the two, three thousand dollar range, but uh, my favorite is is eight thousand dollar guitar. So uh, very different, and I don't tend to use it for these because so many people are playing the steel string guitar. I want to be able to do things on here that most people can relate to. Um, thanks. Uh, I never thought about my uh, Yamaha having a story, but I guess he does. I do tend to have more of a story on my nylon string guitar because I spent a lot of time with them traveling and touring and, uh, you know, trying out different guitars till I found kind of the one that really speaks to me. And it, it wasn't a week or a month. It was years. Ah, so this question, great, Tim. Good timing. Do the nylon strings wear out quicker? Hmm. Yeah. They seem to the the sound, but I the reason I'm not sure is because I'm pickier about the sounds of the nylon string guitar. It's the one that you know I'm really I've recorded with, I've toured with. I, I it's I'm intimate. It's I'm much more intimate with the sound of that the nylon string guitars that I use, and you know I I'm very likely not settle for the optimal sound. Whereas steel string, I'm much more flexible, much more forgiving of the sound. I, I think so in general, the nylon string does. They do break easier, that's for sure. I am not exaggerating. More than once, I've been sitting in a room and my nylon string guitar is on the stand and pop, string just breaks. It has to do, I, I've heard, with the uh, temperature and variations in air pressure. I've never had that happen on a steel string guitar. So I do change the nylon string guitars much more often, probably because I want, I'm, I'm more picky about the sound, but also I do think they tend to, die away a little faster. And it's not the high strings. It's the, those low wound strings that, um, as a matter of fact, uh, for quite a while, I would change the low strings twice as often as the thin fish line strings, the thinner strings, because they would, the thin strings last about twice as long. And you might want to try that. It was, it was saving me money. Um, I don't do that anymore. I, you know, I buy boxes of strings and have a lot of strings. And I often have somebody help me with changing the strings, so I don't want to fuss with all that. I just get it done with all at once. But you, I assume you're changing your own strings. You might want to try buying extra bass strings and changing them more often. Question. How do you hold your hands for finger picking? Do you rest against the guitar to keep hand position correctly? Um, a lot of people do that, and I think that's a good technique. They will put their... Um, pinky on the guitar and pick. I can't do that. My pinky uh, was cut when I was younger and my it's permanently that way. I can't really rest it. But that said, classical guitars would never do that. And I was trained classically. So I have, uh, I even before, I was studying classical guitar before that finger got cut and I, I wasn't accustomed to balancing my finger on the guitar. I will sometimes though, when I'm picking, I will kind of, I use my third finger in place of my pinky. I'll, I'll do this. Because having a finger there, it's easier for me to gauge a distance without looking at my hand. For finger picking, I would say try. It's definitely common for people to put their pinky there. And I don't think most people would ever say that's wrong. It, but I, I, the reason a classical guitarist would never do that, I think, that was never told this. I just wouldn't go there. It's because you have to do a lot of moving and having your finger there would somehow restrict that. You have to do a lot of movement to play uh, finger style classical or finger style guitar in general. Basic finger picking is a little simpler because you're doing the same pattern over and over. It's not as much big movement. I also do this technique, by the way, where I use my pick and my fingers. And I was just doing that without thinking. So the pick gets me the bass notes and my second and third finger, I don't use my pinky. They're floating, but they're picking the other strings. The advantage of that is when I start strumming, the pick's right there. Okay, next question. So how often will you be doing these lessons online? Mark, good question. I will be here 
the very first Tuesday of the month at uh, 12 noon right now. I'm uh, just toying with the idea since um, <clears throat> people are in different parts of the world of trying, uh, offering some different times, but um, I have a very full schedule and, and I have to figure out how to make that work. Uh, my physical music store is closed right now, but we're still doing lessons. All the teachers are teaching online from their home using uh, um, Zoom and FaceTime. So I still have a lot of work to do and I still have a staff that's working, even though we're all in lockdown right now. And uh, this is kind of neat. I, I feel uh, in a way a little more intimate. I feel like I can really talk to you guys. And, uh, maybe I, I even toy with the idea of doing once the whole Real Guitar Live with me and maybe doing another one just me to answer questions like this. This is a little more flexible. I can answer more variety of questions a little more quickly, move around. Uh, Tim says, thanks. That was fun. Yeah, I, I liked it too. More than I thought I would. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. Um, Oh, did you ever think about giving up learning to play guitar when you were first started? How'd you get over frustrations? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure I did. I was so young. Uh, I was a teenager. Um, I even remember a girlfriend telling me, uh, you know, kind of the, the story. I mean, the talk like, come on, dude, get a real job. <laughs> if you, if you want to be a, 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 a decent catch for me, you're going to have to earn a good living. Guitar playing is not going to cut it. Um, but no, I, I was pretty, uh, pretty determined. The girl went, not the guitar. Um, every student I know seems to, at some point, uh, think about giving up. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you're alone. As a matter of fact, I'd say that's the majority, especially as you get older, because I've heard over and over people uh, tell me they just think there's something wrong with them or they don't have it. And they don't realize kind of that gap between what you see people doing who have been playing for years and what you're doing, how it actually goes. And it is a lot of, you know, make some progress and then it seems like you're not getting anywhere for a while and you make a little more progress. And then it seems like you've went backwards a little bit. That is the nature of the beast. Uh, I, I would suggest, especially if, if this is something that, uh, that you want to do, and especially if you're younger, Keep at it. You'll be glad you did when you get older, when you get to be my age. You have a foundation. And I don't mean you have to be a professional guitarist. It is something you can use the rest of your life. And I really encourage you to just keep at it and do it a little at a time. You don't have to spend hours every day. But try to keep coming back at it a little at a time, even if you can only practice 10, 15 minutes a day, five days a week. That's not a lot of time. <clears throat> okay. And one more question before we close up for today. Please... Tell me how to strum for any song. I I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, I'm not even sure uh, what any songs for you would be. But um, bye, Mark. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for joining me. And thanks for your excellent questions. Um, uh, but I would recommend that you learn to strum and not just for any song, but you learn the basic techniques of strumming and as I talked about earlier, learn to strum smoothly and with a little finesse and add uh, add variety of strums and apply them to songs, not the other way around. Oh, I want to learn this song. I got to learn a strum to go with that song. Okay, that's okay once in a while. But you're going to be much happier in the long run if you have a program to learn basic strumming and then apply it to songs that are appropriate at the level that you're at. Okay, so I love to play guitar, but I'm still... No, yeah, yeah. I, and that's very common. That's one of the harder things. It's easier to learn a chord, harder to learn to get from one to the chord to the other in time, and hard to strumming and balance all that together. Bye, bud. Thanks. You be well. And I'm going to close up for today. This has been a pleasure. I, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. And thank you, all of you, for taking the time to be here. Oh, and I do need to give away um, an Amazon gift card. Let's see. I got a list here of the people that um, have uh, completed the program. And here we are, Shulamit. Shulamit, you are the winner. Congratulations. And thanks again for playing along. Okay, I will be back for sure the next Tuesday, the first Tuesday of May, 12 noon. I don't know the exact date yet, but I'll look at my calendar. And I look forward to seeing all you and, and anybody else who wants to join in. Bye for now. Bye, Mr. Pesky.